My guest in this episode is Professor G. Mohan Gopal, who is a former director of the National Law School of India University, Bangalore, and a former director of the National Judicial Academy, Bhopal. His work focuses on the role of law in democratizing social orders as well as on the internal democratization of legal and judicial systems. Mohan Gobal holds a bachelor's degree in law from Delhi University and master's and doctoral degrees in law from Harvard University. Indian constitution is a site of struggle, Mohan Gobal argues here. Various visions of India compete for supremacy and India is currently at a crossroads on this count. The constitution of India is a very unique document. Mm -hmm. It is unlike no other. I don't say this as a cliche, but it really is. If you look at the preamble to the constitution, it says, we the people of India, having solemnly resolved mm -hmm. to constitute India. So when I see the constitution of India, mm -hmm. I see it as a story. It's a process. It's a continuing story of the constitution of a new India. Who are the constituents? Are they individual citizens or are they different communities? There are people who have argued that it is a nation of nations. So who are constituting this nation? Four big forces that were at play mm -hmm. in the creation of this, uh, of, this of this constitution, which mm -hmm. is a project to create a new country. Mm -hmm. But some form of free market uh, India based on capitalism and uh, a strong emphasis and protection All of private property. All these visions property. conflict in the making of the constitution, so the, in the constitutional assembly the, debates? Yes, so it, it, we had all these four uh, uh, forces at play in the constituent assembly, it's very, very obvious. Mm -hmm. They all came together because they sat as the constituent assembly mm -hmm. during the worst years of the violence over, over partition. Mm -hmm. Dead bodies were being brought into and shipped out of Delhi, mm -hmm. you know, when they were in the middle of this flame mm -hmm. of partition. Mm -hmm. Word socially and educationally backward classes was yes, in yes, Article 340 mm -hmm. of the constitution, which required the appointment of a commission mm -hmm. by the President of India mm -hmm. to inquire into the condition of socially and educationally backward classes and to uh, recommend measures for them. When you want representative democracy, you want the strongest backward classes to occupy positions in the public in public employment and in the legislature, mm -hmm. the most effective voices of backward classes. Thank you Mohan Gopal for joining us for this very special discussion on the Indian constitution, the making and the working of the Indian constitution, which provides the terms of engagement between different communities that inhabit this place that we call India, that is Bharat, and how in the process of negotiation, we also create and sustain that entity that we called India, that is Bharat. Welcome to this show and thanks again, uh, Mohan Gopal. So how do you see the making and the working of the Indian constitution as a platform for this negotiation? Thank you, Vergis, for having me. Um, I think, um, we must understand the constitution of India as a very unique document. Mm -hmm. It is unlike no other, I don't say this as a cliche, but it really is. Uh, looking at the history of its making <clears throat> and uh, and the very um, a, a very exceptional way in which it was, the, uh, it was structured by Dr. Ambedkar, mm -hmm. the architecture that he gave to it. So what do I mean by that? Um, if you look at the preamble to the constitution, it says, we the people of India, having solemnly resolved mm -hmm. to constitute India. Mm -hmm. So let's stop there. Mm -hmm. It doesn't say, we the people of India, having constituted India. Mm -hmm. It says, we the people of India, having uh, solemnly resolved to constitute India. Mm -hmm. But it says, we the people of India, mm -hmm. and to constitute India. Mm -hmm. So when you say to constitute India, it means to create India, mm -hmm. which means India doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. the, that, uh, so it's an announcement in January of 1950 mm -hmm. that we, the people of India, are going to constitute India mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. a sovereign socialist democratic republic. Mm -hmm. right. So um, when you take that as an announcement, mm -hmm. then you understand the word constitution mm -hmm. as present continuous verb. Mm -hmm. The process of constituting India, the story of the constitution of India. So when I see the constitution of India, mm -hmm. I see it as a story. It's a process. It's a continuing story mm -hmm. of the constitution 
of a new India mm -hmm. that did not exist. Mm -hmm. So when they said we the people of India, they were using India mm -hmm. as in a generic term as a subcontinent, not as a polity. Mm -hmm. We the inhabitants of the subcontinent mm -hmm. have decided to constitute mm -hmm. a new polity called India. Mm -hmm which has never existed before mm. for a vast populace mm. um, covering a vast segment of the earth uh, into something unique, a democratic, uh, you know, socialist, uh, rep secular republic. And um, uh, so that was, in fact, I think the then uh, Prime Minister of, uh, of, uh, of Britain said something to the effect that this was uh, the, the, probably the greatest enterprise that humanity has ever ventured into. Mm -hmm. But to, so what we are now trying to discuss is the process of the creation of a new entity that is, uh, that is no, that has never existed in the past. So India in the constitution is not 5,000 years old, it's not 10,000 years old, mm -hmm. you know, it's something new that we are building. So that's the first point I'd like to make that we are really embarked upon a unique exercise to build something completely new. Mm -hmm. So who are the constituents? Are they individual citizens? or are they different communities or people who have argued that it is a nation of nations. So who are constituting this nation? So, um, uh, you know, there we have to look at it at two levels. Mm -hmm. uh, when when uh, I said earlier that the resolve was to constitute a new polity, mm -hmm. we the populace of mm -hmm. this uh, of the subcontinent mm -hmm. uh, called India. Um, the polity is constituted by states, so mm -hmm. it's a federal polity. Mm -hmm. The states, you know, we, the India that is Bharat shall be a union of states. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the, um, the uh, democratic uh, power behind this polity, mm -hmm. who, who, are, who is constituting this polity mm -hmm. is we the people, mm -hmm. we the people. Mm -hmm. Now there, uh, I think the, 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 the beauty of it is that there are different conceptualizations. Mm -hmm. And I, I've, uh, I, I've, I've been arguing that there are four big forces that were at play mm -hmm. in the creation of this, uh, of this, con of this constitution, which mm -hmm. is a project to create a new country. Mm -hmm. And we can broadly place them as two forces on the left and two forces on the right. Mm -hmm. I'm using left in the original sense of the term, which was uh, established 30 years before Marx was born in the French National Assembly as being pro-people and pro-poor, and right as being pro-powerful, pro-rich, uh, and so on. So on the left, we had a social left and an economic left mm -hmm. that were already very strong by the time the Constituent Assembly began its work to, mm -hmm. to uh, write this constitution. And the social left uh, really consists of, uh, represented by Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly, but building upon a strong tradition of uh, social reform movements all across the country mm -hmm. for stretching back maybe a century or more, but even before that, mm -hmm. you can go much further, but certainly uh, in, into the 19th century with uh, Pule, Narayana Guru, various others in the country. So that tradition of the social left, they had a vision mm -hmm. about uh, what kind of India that mm -hmm. they need to construct. We had an economic left mm -hmm. that included by then socialists, communists who had a, a modernist but left of a view of what India should be. Mm -hmm. We are on the right, we had a, soci a, a social right mm -hmm. that basically wanted to take India back to a Vedic idea of a Hindu Rashtra, Vedic based Hindu Rashtra. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, an economic right that basically wanted some form of also a modernist view, but some form of free market uh, India based on capitalism and uh, a strong emphasis and protection of private property. All these missions conflict in the making of the constitution, so the, in the constitutional assembly the, debates? Yes. So it, it, we had all these four uh, uh, forces at play in the constituent assembly is very, very obvious. Mm -hmm. And the architecture that Dr. Ambedkar, Ambedkar created, unlike all other constitutions, but usually all constitutions involve conflicting forces. Right. But usually one force is victorious and imposes its own view mm -hmm. exclusively in the constitution and the constitution falls apart, it breaks apart. Mm -hmm. uh, Indian constitution is not broken apart because Dr. Ambedkar had a different architecture. He brought all these four forces into the framework of the constitution mm -hmm. and provided each of them mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. to put in their own agenda. Mm -hmm. And so what he was trying to do was, okay, let's now carry on this conflict mm -hmm. 
through a democratic process mm. within these structures and institutions created by the constitution in a bottom-up manner and let the future evolve mm. in terms of how this uh, the, the fine print of this constitution is uh, of this nation mm. is going to be written and mm. going to be defined so therefore i as uh, uh, you know as i've been saying in other places also i see the constitution as being constructed as a site of struggle mm -hmm. between these four very large forces there are i can break it down further but for simplicity mm -hmm. i'm keeping it to these four large forces which had very conflicting visions of mm -hmm. what india should be mm -hmm. rather than give one primacy mm -hmm. dr ambedkar brought into the constitution a uh, space for all of them so that conflict uh is continuing in that side. Yes. And of the four visions that were being negotiated in the Constituent Assembly, yes. are we living in an age when one of those, yes. that is the vision of India as a Hindu Rashtra, is gain an upper hand at the moment? Yeah, I think before we get to that, I think uh, the the the, uh, the primacy mm -hmm. in the preamble and in the Constitution mm -hmm. uh, uh, was uh, accepted by all the four forces mm. to certain ideas mm -hmm. of uh, equality, liberty, fraternity and dignity. Mm -hmm. They interpreted it in their own way, mm -hmm. but they accepted it. Why did they accept it? Because they all came together because they sat as the constituent assembly mm -hmm. during the worst years of the violence over, over partition. Mm -hmm. Dead bodies were being brought into and shipped out of Delhi mm -hmm. you know, when they were in the middle of this flame mm -hmm. of partition. Mm -hmm. And so I think they were all united, uh, they, sorry, they were all agreed mm -hmm. that we have to build a framework mm -hmm that will ensure that Indians don't slaughter each other the way that's happened and that we are united. So the unity of the country was, I think, very focal for them, mm -hmm. except they had their own bona fide mm -hmm. uh, ideas about how to achieve that, uh, how to achieve that unity. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think uh, they by and large respected that for some time mm -hmm. and the, the unity was built mm -hmm. uh, and I think we have survived and we have uh, actually uh, stayed together, uh, you know, beating various predictions uh, mm -hmm. that India will not stay together. So, but now I think that consensus is, uh, has started to has started to break down because the uh, these ideas mm -hmm. uh, on which there was a consensus mm -hmm. that there should be individual equality, liberty, and uh, dignity. Mm -hmm. They have had to. Uh, they've had an effect mm -hmm. of empowering those who are excluded, mm -hmm. and um, and now there is a challenge faced to the powerful from these sections, mm -hmm. and so they're pushing back on these fundamental ideas. We must mention that we are in the eighth decade of our constitution. Mm -hmm. The United States had its civil war in the eighth decade of its constitution, mm -hmm. so in 1861 to 65. So we are exactly at that point where they had a civil war. And I think in a different way, mm. if you, you can say a civil war is when the internal conflicts reach a, a zenith mm -hmm. and, and, and become unsolvable. We may be re reaching that because we've had a whiff of democracy like the Americans had in the first so eight decades. Yeah. And then they said, look, as Lincoln said, mm. was no flaming heart liberal. Mm. He said, this nation cannot be half slave and half free. Mm -hmm. So it, it took eight decades for, for to someone like Lincoln to, to realize mm. that there was no future for the country without, uh, you know, with slavery and slavery had to go. Mm -hmm. And similarly, I think um, many people in our country have realized, mm -hmm. number one, that this country cannot move forward without equality, liberty, secularism, dignity uh, for, for all. On the other hand, there is a group of people like the South of the United States uh, who have come to the conclusion that this nation will not move forward mm -hmm. with equality, liberty, dignity and fraternity. It will move forward only on the basis of a feudal social order. Mm -hmm. So uh, they had to fight a war. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we have resilience and flexibility in our institutions that will ensure that we can move forward with this original vision and stay together. So you have argued elsewhere uh, that while we describe India as a union of states, that is a political structuring of that uh, the entity, a better way of conceptually understanding it is to understand it as a union of communities yes. 
What do you mean by that? Yeah, I, I've argued that not in contradiction or contradistinction to, uh, to Union States. of States because that's a polity. But uh, the people of this country and we, uh, hum humans are social animals and therefore we are organized as social groups and we can call them communities. And therefore, India is a, uh, is a very diverse uh, uh, country. What we mean by that is there's tremendous diversity of the kinds of social groups that we have. If you take social groups as, as uh, people that come together around common beliefs, common practices, common habits, common cultures, we have very large diversity of communities. And these communities are very essential to maintaining the character of people, the character of our culture, of our, of our civilization. And, uh, and, and therefore, uh, we, we, if we want to understand, there was the social left view. I said there are four views. The social left view mm -hmm. was that India is a, um, is a, uh, is a, uh, a union of communities. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this was reflected, I think, very strongly mm -hmm. in the first important intervention of Indians into the process of building a constitution for India, mm -hmm. at that time a colonial constitution of, or a constitution, a colonial constitution of colonial India. Mm -hmm. And that was in the first round table conference mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Dr. Ambedkar and mm -hmm. various others, uh, first round table conference, Gandhi, the Gandhiji was not there, mm -hmm. he attended the second one. But in the very first round table conference, <clears throat> Ambedkar made a couple of very important interventions. Mm -hmm. what, were th what were these interventions? First of all, he, he, he said that uh, uh, in, in India will be, he rightly predicted that India will be ruled by an oligarchy when the British leave. Mm -hmm. So the constitutional structure must have safeguards against an oligarchy ruling, in the, uh, ruling the country. That's the word he used. He mm -hmm. said aristocracy, which would be an oligarchy that would rule. The second thing he said is that um, uh, that the um, way to address an oligarchy is to have representative uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. And, and that, also specifically he argues for proportionate representation that based we, on communities. So we, we come to that. So he basically, he told the uh, round table conference that everyone is here. Uh, we are also here to ask for responsible government, mm -hmm. elected government. Mm -hmm. But he said the depressed classes of this of, of India mm -hmm. have an additional demand, which is equally important, that we must have representative democracy mm -hmm. and representative government. Mm -hmm. And he uh, presented a memorandum with eight conditions mm -hmm. and safeguards for the depressed classes mm -hmm. to the roundtable conference. Mm -hmm. uh, safeguard number four and number five mm -hmm. were on representation. Mm -hmm. uh, four was on representative legislature mm -hmm. and five was on representation in the ex, in the uh, in public employment which is executive and and judiciary mm -hmm. and um, and there he asked for a re a representation in the legislature uh, he, uh, he, for backward classes or for as at that time depressed classes um, and he wanted uh, the depressed classes to have a separate electorate mm -hmm for 10 years mm -hmm. after that joint electorate. Now, it was not a kind of wild demand because already by then separate electorates were in place for minorities, for uh, Muslims and, um, and rich people, mm -hmm. uh, for graduates, mm -hmm. uh, for various people. Christians also had a uh, separate electorates. So he said, look, we d uh, depressed classes must also have a separate electorate mm -hmm. along with the others mm -hmm. for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And then after that, because he said he wanted a leadership to develop amongst the uh, the uh, depressed classes. Right. After that, he said we must have res reservation for unrepresented depressed classes. Mm. But in the executive and the judiciary, condition number five, in the public services, mm. he began by saying that the, we, we have a very big problem that the public services are monopolized by the, his words, the Hindu upper caste, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and they are, they have a monopoly, mm -hmm. and they are misusing that, abusing that monopoly to benefit themselves, and denying justice, equity, and good conscience, his words, to the depressed classes. Mm -hmm. So he demanded that, that there must be due and adequate representation of all communities, mm -hmm. all communities, not just depressed classes, mm -hmm. in the judiciary and the executive. Mm -hmm. So all this together would create a state mm -hmm. that had representation from all communities, mm -hmm. depressed classes and uh, all communities for executive and judiciary. So the, the question of separate electorates become, uh, uh, he had to give up that particular part of the yes. demand, Puna Pact yes. comes into play. But the, the, the question of separate representation or... A due and adequate representation yeah. of all communities. Right. Yes. That gets written into the constitution. It gets written into the constitution as Article 16.4 mm -hmm. with two important changes. Mm -hmm. In the original language of uh, Dr. Ambedkar, 
the word reservation is missing. Mm -hmm. The word backward is missing. Mm -hmm. The word classes is missing. Mm -hmm. Now, what does he ask for? As I said, he wants due and adequate representation of all communities. Mm -hmm. How? Mm -hmm. He says, uh, by the regulation of recruitment into public employment, mm -hmm. so as to ensure due and adequate representation of all communities. Mm -hmm. So instead of reservation, mm -hmm. Dr. Ambedkar says, we want regulation of recruitment into public employment. Mm -hmm and um, uh, to, rep to ensure representation. Mm -hmm. But in 164, mm -hmm. it was the drafting committee that, in that included in uh, the provision for reservation for backward classes into 164, mm -hmm. uh, into the draft constitution. Mm -hmm. And there the words backward and representation came in because of the history of what was all, had already started to take place in the Madras province of the British, in Maharashtra under Shambhu, uh, Shambhu um, Shah, Shahu Maharaj, mm -hmm. and um, in Mysore and in Travancore. Right. Where as a result of anti-Brahmin movements, mm -hmm. representations or non-Brahmin movements, representation had, had been given to non-Brahmin communities. Mm -hmm. That was called reservation. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and uh, they were also considered backward uh, communities. So mm -hmm. these words crept in from that experience. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ambedkar, it was not part of his original formulation, mm -hmm. but as chair of the drafting committee, he, 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 he took it because that was the way to explain what was going on, to show that there was a precedent uh, for what he was asking for. So that provision translates into state policy immediately after uh, the independence right. as 15% reservation for scheduled caste yes and proportionately to the proportion to the population of tribals in each yes, region yes 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 uh, <coughs> 7% percent right or right and no, then it, it's it's uh, 8 point some percent now 60 no, yeah. yeah yeah but uh, so that actually begins immediately yeah. after the constitution that's comes because out. the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe lists already existed mm -hmm. under the 1935 act so that was just continued yeah. for what is now called the other backward classes right that had to wait for several decades. Right. What is the history of that? So uh, the um, uh, the the uh, word socially and educationally backward classes was yes, in yes. Article three forty mm -hmm. of the Constitution, which required the appointment of a commission mm -hmm. by the President of India mm -hmm. to inquire into the condition of socially and educationally backward classes and to uh, recommend measures for them. Um, and that was the Kelkar Commission that was appointed not lo long after independence and that was infructuous. They made recommendations but Kelkar himself backed off from those recommendations. To add, he identified the communities. Now this was necessary because scheduled caste, scheduled tribe li lists were there. Mm -hmm. But uh, the point was made by Dr. Ambedkar and others that there were many other communities that also suffered from untouchability or social exclusion and needed to be accommodated and needed to be given representation. Um, and therefore this commission provision was put in. And so because the Kelkar, the union government those days under Prime Minister Nehru did not act on identifying the list through this commission and making recommendations for their reservation didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So after the Kelkar commission uh, did not come up with a definitive uh, recommendation, uh, it did come up with a recommendation but the chairman it's himself disowned it. Um, then uh, Prime Minister Nehru writes to all the states saying, look, you can set up your own commissions and you decide we are not going to in intervene. And then some states came in and started to est establish their own commission mm -hmm. and uh, statutorily and identify backward classes and start to give reservation. Um, so that's why there was a delay in, in getting reservation. Um, uh, for But Article 16.4 refers only to backward classes mm -hmm. as including scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. This is reservation public employment. So as well as other, that's where the word, the concept, it's not in the constitution, other backward classes. Mm -hmm. It's not in 16.4, but the word other backward classes came in mm -hmm. because of the fact that it includes SCST and other backward classes. So some people have argued against the reservation for OBCs, what right. we call OBCs, based on the premise that the discrimination that the scheduled caste faced due to untouchability and the tribals faced due to geographical isolation is not comparable to other backward classes do, who do not face the stigma <coughs> of untouchability. Yes. How do you view that? Yeah, so that's a very important point you've raised. Uh, and, that, and that, I think to understand that, we very briefly go back to the, uh, to the fact that there are two ways in which 
uh, the, the issue was uh, was looked at mm -hmm. from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. One view was that of the social left, mm -hmm. uh, which was to say what we want is representation. Mm -hmm. Nothing to do with backwardness, nothing to do with poverty, mm -hmm. nothing to do with historical discrimination. We, it's, we want due and adequate representation of all communities, mm -hmm. which is what Dr. Ambedkar had said in 1930 to the first roundtable conference. Right. That's the view of the social left. Mm -hmm. So the question is not whether the um, ones, the, the communities that have suffered greater untouchability uh, or lesser untouchability should or should not get representation, including the, the Savarna communities, all communities must have due and adequate representation proportionate to their population. Mm -hmm. Adequate means the smallest communities must have some level of effectiveness. This was the view of the social left. Mm -hmm. But this soon got uh, pushed aside mm -hmm. by a view shared by the, the oligarchy that had taken, social oligarchy, the dominant uh, mm -hmm. castes and communities of the country that uh, got a monopoly of power after the Muslims left and the British were packed off. And they took the view, they could not digest the idea there would, that there would be due and adequate representation of all communities because they were very they are a very small community right and therefore they would be marginalized mm -hmm. so for example if you take india supreme court today mm -hmm. we have 34 judges and of the 34 judges the number keeps changing something like 15 or 16 or so at some point of time are brahmins alone mm -hmm. let alone from a brahmin okay. community let alone other dominant groups mm -hmm. And there's, I think, couple of one Muslim, couple of uh, Dalits. Um, I don't know if there's any Christian now on it at all. Mm -hmm. I, I can't remember, but maybe one or two at the most. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you have a representative Supreme Court today, mm -hmm. you would have eight members, due and adequate, roughly speaking, of the 34, eight judges mm -hmm. from the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities. Mm -hmm. You will have five from the uh, religious minorities. Mm -hmm. You would have 20 from the um, uh, the Avarna or non-Varna backward classes mm -hmm. and maybe you would have one from the, uh, the Dvija uh, group, mm -hmm. one judge. Mm -hmm. Now if you had a, a court like that with eight SCS people mm -hmm. from SCST and mm -hmm. this critical mass mm -hmm. and 20 from other Avarna minorities, mm -hmm. I think the jurisprudence of that court would be very different from what we are seeing today. Mm -hmm. Very different. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So and the, So naturally those who are Gay, who are getting a disproportionate mm -hmm. uh, slice of the cake mm -hmm. simply did not want to allow the demand for representative democracy which was expressed in the United States as no taxation without representation mm -hmm. and spread all over uh, Europe and so on. They wanted to keep that down so they started to focus on this issue of D uh, compensation for past discrimination of the worst kind. So that, that's, a, that's a good entry point to how these questions of uh, the concept of union of communities yes. gets played out in Supreme Court cases. Yes, yes. So immediately after the Republic came yes. into being, the idea of community-based quotas yes. in yes. education got challenged and it, got, it gets struck down yes. by the Supreme Court in the Chambagam Dorai Raja case. case. Yes. And then that had to be overturned through a constitutional amendment that yes. became the first amendment, amendment to the yes. constitution. Can you tell us? With the background to that sure. thing and how the constitutional yeah. amendment came into being. Sure, because the, this was called what was called the communal order mm -hmm. of the uh, the Madras. Madras government, the colonial Madras government, mm -hmm. that actually laid down uh, you know quotas for representation of different communities. The uh, a, the dominant communities immediately after the constitution came into effect challenged this in the Madras High Court, saying this violates equality. Now that we have equality, there's no charter in this subcontinent that had given equality in in the history of India. So so the moment, ironically, the moment we had a charter for equality, it was the most powerful who demanded equality against the, the deprived people. That was upheld by the High Court, upheld by the Supreme Court. And then Article 15 was uh, amended to clarify that the uh, state has the power to, um, uh, to uh, make provisions uh, for uh, the uh, socially and educationally backward classes. Because the argument made by the court was that there is no such provision in Article 15. This covered edu education under Article 15. The, there was also employment involved in that case, but basically said that uh, you you didn't have an explicit provision in the Constitution for it, and you can and the, you are violating a fundamental right. So Article 15 is also a fundamental right. So they amended it, built built it into the fundamental right. 
So, but uh, frankly, the, the issue still was what is the justification for reservation? What is the rationale for reservation? Mm -hmm. right? So, the rationale was maintained by the Supreme Court and by the liberal left and all of them as past discrimination and poverty elevation. Mm -hmm. They never conceded the mm -hmm. main demand that was made by the depressed classes from 1930 mm -hmm saying we want representative government based on due and adequate representation of all communities. Mm -hmm. If we had that, um, I think the situation in the country would have been very different uh, without any doubt. But the Supreme Court, uh, the constitution of the Supreme Court, the composition of the Supreme Court remaining as it does, as, as you described. By the time the Mandal Commission report gets challenged in the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. it has a different view. Yes. It actually watch, uh, rules in favor. Yes upholding the Mandal Commission uh, report and reservation for the other backward classes yes, yes. Uh, in the Indira Swani case. Yes. Uh, what, yes. what were the arguments there right. and how did So there was a whole slew of uh, judgments on, uh, on in, the uh, in, the, in the interim. Uh, but all these judgments are consistently taking the dominant class view mm -hmm. that reservation is affirmative action. Mm -hmm. Now affirmative action is a US phrase. Mm -hmm that refers to <clears throat> a method mm -hmm. to include those who are excluded mm -hmm. uh, from a minority. Mm -hmm. the, because representative government had already been accepted by them and mm -hmm. they are achieving it because they, they, they are the majority are, uh, are white people mm -hmm. and the, those who are excluded were a small minority. Mm -hmm. And so affirmative action was a means of including the minority. Mm -hmm. But for us, the big demand mm -hmm. had not been achieved, which mm -hmm. was that we want representative government. Mm -hmm. So through all these era, uh, all these cases during this entire era, mm -hmm. Supreme Court has consistently turned a blind eye to the demand for representative government till I think to some extent in EWS, we'll come to that. But so even Mandal Commission mm -hmm. uh, did not, um, uh, the, the Indra Sawani judgment of Mandal Commission strongly re reaffirmed that this is for the poor amongst the backward classes because by, of past discrimination by excluding the creamy layer, mm -hmm. by excluding the creamy layer saying that uh, if, now, if it was representation, mm. it is like saying, yes, India must have a seat in the Security Council, mm. but the the uh, uh, the creamy layer of India cannot be ambassador of India. Mm. Only you know poor people can can represent India mm -hmm. because otherwise the the, the 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 oligarchy will capture all these positions. Mm. No, that that would be ridiculous, right? You have to if India has to be represented, you have to select the most effective, most representative person to go there. Whoever it is, we must have a process for that. Similarly, when you want representative democracy, you want the strongest backward classes to occupy positions in the public in public employment and in the legislature, mm -hmm. the most effective voices of backward classes. Mm -hmm. You can't exclude them. And uh, be, because, you know, it, that would lead to a diminution of representative democracy. Mm -hmm. So you can see that the Supreme Court has consistently taken the dominant view of accommodating, mm -hmm. reluctantly accommodating mm -hmm. uh, some space mm -hmm. uh, for at the lowest level, no, not in promotions, mm -hmm. not in sensitive positions, mm -hmm. not in complex positions, because they think that we're dealing with incompetent people, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, with, there are 12, I'm not getting into that, there are 12 sets of restrictions that have been shackles that have been judicially put into reservation mm. to basically disable reservations as a tool for representation. Yeah, so what I'm saying is that uh, the uh, uh, Supreme Court, uh, by adopting the theory that what we are doing is affirmative action, which is to include people who are excluded, who are, uh, who are denied opportunities, rather than representing social groups, um, has been able to uh, to sidestep the question of should India be a representative democracy mm -hmm. and uh, so that's what it has done but uh, to do that it is uh, it has re uh, limited uh, uh, reservation uh, put number of restrictions as I said there are a dozen uh, restrictions that have been judicially put for example 50 percent that you it cannot there must be a 50 percent ceiling with some exception that came from Indra Sawney you must have a creamy layer uh, exclusion cannot apply to uh, to promotions it uh, you exempted a large number of the mo key key positions so that you look at uh, the numbers at key positions you know it's 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 actually staggering the 
the domination of an oligarchy over the top positions of this country. India is basically ruled by four communities and they dominate all sectors, you know, in, in terms of powerful key positions. So uh, that's possible only because you've exempted key positions from reservations. So through all these mechanisms, basically they've tried to accept reservations. It's a constitutional requirement, but in such a manner that it will never lead to a representative government or representative democracy. So what is this concept of 50% ceiling? Yes. How does it originate and how does it evolve? Yes. The idea that, as I said earlier, Dr. Ambedkar had formulated was that, uh, that there should be a regulation of recruitment into public services so as to ensure due and adequate representation. He, he emphasized a modulation of recruitment to look at the, the representation and adjust as necessary. So, for example, if you want this new newsroom of yours to be representative, you look at you know how many men, how many women, how many communities, regions, whatever criteria you want. And if you find that some criteria, let's say male or let's say dominant class, the big story in India is that uh, newsrooms are c completely dominated by the oligarchy. So if you find that there, there's a huge domination for them. So what, what do you do? You modulate your new hires such that you don't add to these dominant groups, you, uh, you bring in other groups that are not represented, mm -hmm. then you reach a point where there is uh, representation, then you don't need, then you can start again changing the modulation so that the balance is maintained. Mm -hmm. So it requires a constant, that's why it's not for 10 years, mm -hmm. it's a permanent mechanism mm -hmm. to ensure representation, permanent which must be but dynamic. A, a modulation, mm -hmm. yeah, D yes, flexible, mm -hmm. dynamic, looking at the results, looking at the constant reality, who, who is running this government, who is running this country. Mm -hmm. And that's why you need also a census about different communities because you need to have accurate figures. Mm -hmm. And that's why in, when we, we started to switch the debate mm -hmm. and our, our uh, uh, interventions in EWS helped a lot from rep we, uh, re reservation to representation, mm -hmm. you know, uh, then reservation did not require a census, but representation requires a census. Mm -hmm. So census has become extremely important mm -hmm. because now I think finally mm -hmm. after, uh, you know, in this eighth decade, mm -hmm. this decisive eighth decade, mm -hmm. Uh, we are putting back on the front burner the demand for representative government. The question is, will the Supreme Court take this on board? Will it accept that representative democracy is the only way forward for India uh, is the question. Or will it block it by, by blunting the only tool that can get us represent, peaceful tool that can get us represented with democracy is this instrument of reservation. The 10% the reservation yes. or which is actually mislabeled as for economically weaker session. Yes, yes. You were a petitioner yes. in the Supreme Court against the decision. Yes. But I was not the petitioner, I argued for the petitioner. Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah. I stand corrected. Yeah. So you argued for the petitioner. Uh, so the Supreme Court upheld that decision. Yes. How do you view that thing and how, what does it do to this fundamental notion or demand for yeah. representation? I said to the Supreme Court uh, uh, and, and in, 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 at the beginning that uh, this case, the EWS case, Janhita Bhyan, is the ADM Jabalpur of uh, social justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was reflected at the towards the end of the arguments in open court. It had not the, the fifth day of argument. The sixth day it was live streamed. So this was not live streamed. But uh, uh, Chief Justice of India, Justice ba uh, Lalit, U U Lalit, he and um, he said in open court uh, after we are at the end of the arguments. He said, um, you know, the real issue before this court is. All these years we've been used to having some discrimination against dominant classes to benefit others. But now we are uh, going to discriminate against the, I'm not quoting me exactly, but almost same words, that we are going to discriminate against weaker sections to benefit the dominant groups. Is, descending judgment. No, no, he, did, he said this from the bench, okay. from the bench, oral observation. Okay. Oral observation. And he said, does the constitution permit this? This is the real question, he said. Mm. I agree with him mm. because this was the first time uh, that we are making birth into mm. a, a privileged community, mm. a privileged class, a socially and educationally forward class, mm. a prerequisite mm. for getting a government benefit. Mm. That, so if you look at EWS, they are saying it's economically weaker section. Mm. 
But you cannot get it unless you first prove that you are a member of a socially and educationally forward class mm -hmm. who is suffering from some financial distress, mm -hmm. not economic distress, but financial distress, mm -hmm. looking only at financial characteristics, not at multidimensional economic weakness. Mm -hmm. So you, it, you, are, you are then going to get assistance only for members of the socially and educationally forward classes mm -hmm. who are already overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to basically insulate 10% of every classroom and every office in this country from uh, being used for enhancing representation mm -hmm. by reserving it for those who are already overrepresented. Mm -hmm. And um, so in this way, see, the, the John Rawls, a famous, uh, American. famous American uh, legal philosopher, had, had uh, articulated what he called the difference principle. That is, you can only discriminate against someone uh, and violate the, the rule of equality, not violate, but, uh, but deny equal treatment to someone uh, in order to advance equality, in order to benefit the least, dis uh, the most disadvantaged, the least advantaged sections of society. And that fundamental rule is violated here, That's the difference principle. That's the, yeah, the, the principle is called the difference principle, that, okay. that, 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 that you cannot uh, differentiate mm -hmm. between people except to benefit the least because then you're advancing the overall ideal of equality. Mm -hmm. So here you're picking social and educationally forward classes. Now, question which I argued in the alternative, I believe this whole thing is unconstitutional. The alternative was, why don't you, if you believe you're giving it to economically weaker sections, why don't you give it to the truly economically weaker sections of the country without looking at whether they're socially forward or socially backward? Why do you insist that you'll only help socially forward classes and you will exclude socially backward classes who do not have other reservation? and who are uh, in, in more distressed than the people you are helping. So there was from, no answer to that. So in the Chambagam Durai Raja case, the Supreme Court took a view, which was reformed or refined in subsequent judgments through uh, under Indira, Indira Swani judgment. In the EW's judgment, we are actually seeing the court taking a U-turn and going to the... See, in, in the EW, see all these other judgments basically accommodated to a small extent uh, discrimination, quote unquote, they saw it as discrimination, not as representation. For me, it is not discrimination, it's representation. But they saw it as discrimination in favor of backward groups and impoverished groups. I see it as representation, political representation of all communities. They accommodated that. Um, Champakam Dorai Rajan said, you cannot even do that because it violates the principle of equality. That's what the Supreme Court said. But they moved away from that position and said, yes, we can uh, we can accommodate those who are the weakest and so on and so forth with all these exclusions because it advances equality. But what they did in EWS for the first time was they said, we will favor the dominant classes, discriminate against the weaker sections. Mm -hmm. So you can have, and we, we are now having cases in Kerala. Kerala government has issued a list of EWS co community. I'm very ashamed as uh, Malayali that this has been done, where they the column for the eligible communities is Jati. It's written Jati. And they have the list of the most powerful Jatis, Nambudri, men, and this all these most powerful Jatis, Syrian Christian Jatis are all there. And you have to belong to those Jatis to get EWS. And uh, there are... Uh, 782 communities in Kerala, very poor communities, including say Eritachan community, Kumbaran community, who are have a total of 3% reservations, huge population. And um, they are uh, denied, they don't get reservation. The Kumbarans almost never get any reservation and they're d extremely marginalized and poor. Now you have, uh, you know, Nambudris and <laughs> Nayas, who are uh, getting, uh, you know, there it's four lakhs, not eight lakhs in Kerala, whatever the number is, and have less than certain amount of land and uh, urban property and all that, who are getting reservations when these poorest people are not getting any reservations as a OBC or as a CST. And, um, and so you are discriminating actually against the poorest people in the name of economically weaker section under an article in the constitution, article 46, which says that you can... Uh, you must, uh, you know, the state must take special measures to assist educationally and economically weaker sections, especially scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, who are victims of social justice and exploitation. 
but they have removed the requirement for social justice and exploitation. They have removed the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So that's why I said it's an ADM Jabalpur uh, situation. You have you have basically said it's okay under the constitution to give to make birth a privilege in this country. Mohan Gobal, let me take you to one of the earlier points that you made in this conversation. That is India as a union of communities. Yes. So by implicit acceptance or even explicit articulation, the makers of the constitution and even those debates that are leading into those days of independence, there is an understanding that we accept religions as communities mm. and linguistic groups as communities. Yes. So the debate on caste justice that we are now discussing in the last few uh, segments, that is actually a discussion within the Hindu community. Am I right? Yeah, no, the, the, what we were confronted with uh, in the, at, at the independence was uh, we had the specter of massive conflict over religion mm -hmm. um, and, uh, the, and, and caste conflict was also very rife, caste exploitation was very rife. And so the question was how will we deal with religion and, and caste? Mm -hmm. And um, and the uh, effort of the oligarchy that rules India even now was uh, to have multiple strategies to do this. One strategy was to construct an idea of citizenship that mm -hmm. they would control mm -hmm. and erase whatever social identities were not convenient mm -hmm. and then accommodate everyone into citizen. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the other was uh, to, uh, to configure everyone into classes, working class, and then wipe out the social identity and make everyone a class. Uh, but these are all ways to control it. But there was a third group in which I think all of them agreed that uh, if India has to find unity and it should not disturb the oligarchy, then we have to construct a, a, a common religion mm -hmm. for the 85% of the country after partition, a mm -hmm. common religion. Mm -hmm. So they started to construct this Hindu religion. Mm -hmm. Now, how f to, to understand how fragile it was, mm -hmm. we should uh, remember that uh, Dr. Ambedkar uh, in 1936 in Annihilation of Caste attacked this, uh, this uh, Hindu religion mm -hmm. very strongly. Mm -hmm. And, and he converted after, of course, after the constitution, he converted into Buddhism. Mm -hmm. But even more radically and more importantly, Narayana Guru in Kerala in 1925, on the 11th day after the RSS was established in Nagpur, he publicly said in the Kerala Kaumadi uh, newspaper, there is no such thing as a Hindu religion. It doesn't, there is no religion called Hindu religion. Because mm -hmm. he was very concerned. Narayana Guru had said, uh, that the great challenge that India faces, not just Kerala, he said, he used the word India, uh, not Bharat. He said, what India faces is a great challenge of uh, conflict over caste and religion. Mm -hmm. And he came up with an approach mm -hmm. of, uh, of resolving that. But that was a big, big conflict. So Hindu was such a fragile identity that only 25 years before the uh, independence, uh, as great a thinker, scholar, philosopher, uh, uh, as uh, Sri Narayana Guru, denied its very existence. Right. But even then, even Ambedkar, who is actually questioning the legitimacy of Hinduism as a religion, etc., in the making of the constitution, by asserting the authority to reform Hindu religious practices, yes. including Nehru and Ambedkar, they are actually implicitly accepting that uh, that that as a category and the legitimacy their authority to reform that segment of the population as opposed to muslim social reforms which they actually leave it as an autonomous <coughs> community engagement that the community itself will have to negotiate so that is pretty evident so at the time when the uh, the uh, reform of hindu law was uh, discussed we were dealing with a large group of people uh, who uh, did not have clear rules on a number of aspects of uh, marriage, succession, inheritance, and, and, uh, and so on. Um, very diverse sets of rules. And many of these rules were very inequitable. And, um, and they covered maybe one section of the Savarnas, but the vast majority of them were uh, outside that framework. And so, uh, they, 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 there was a big issue of, of bringing some principles of, uh, of fairness and, e and equality and equal rights 
which were in the constitution into the um, into the laws that governed uh, uh, this vast population so at that time hindu was not as was not only a religion it was just a residual social group mm -hmm. of those who were not basically uh, muslim or christian mm -hmm. because they had their own fairly you know not by any means uh, perfect but mm -hmm. their own clear religious principles and personal law rules mm -hmm. and um, and there was also a, a, a commitment in the constitution that personal law not inconsistent which sorry which is inconsistent only those not inconsistent with the fundamental rights would survive mm -hmm. which had a flip obligation obviously mm -hmm. um, uh, that uh, if they were inconsistent with fundamental rights then they should be reformed so this large group of people were were sort of brought into some some framework to to help the weaker those who were disempowered and marginalized amongst them so i don't think we can say that as in any way the constitution has only one reference other than the uh, kerala and tamil nadu payment to the hindu uh, endowment uh, under devas from board and so on there's only one reference to the hindu religion in the constitution that is in article 252b mm -hmm. where the constitution empowers the state to make laws to uh, end exclusion of uh, of hindus from their own religious institutions by using the word throwing open mm -hmm. re hindu religious institutions to all sections of hindus mm -hmm. so almost violent word throwing open not mm -hmm. opening up throwing open mm -hmm. right so it was an, an attempt to actually address this exclusion within hinduism mm -hmm. but there is no uh, and then they bring within that for those purposes they bring in three other religions which had also maintained within their actual day to day practice of religion these kinds of exclusions namely hindu jain and sikh mm -hmm. and uh, so they for that purpose they say this right to reform to include people and stop exclusion will also be uh, extend to these three religions but there was the constitution never accepted hindu as a uh, as a as a distinct identity or distinct religion the supreme court has said oh, many things about it yes certainly uh, 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 those who have a variety of beliefs are brought under the broad rubric of being being hindu but the constitution has famously uh, said that it's a way of life mm -hmm. also and you don't yes religion is a way of life but uh, uh, but no religion is described as a way of life it's a way of life flowing from the religion mm -hmm. you know not uh, an independent way of life mm -hmm. but the supreme court has said that look the hinduism is is not but just a religion but the it's concept more than that. of uh, union of communities also concedes some kind of sovereignty to individual communities like muslims or christians no you see the point is the question is what is the unit what tribal yeah, groups what is the unit of representation yes. that's the question mm -hmm. right when you say community mm -hmm. so that has to be democratic mm -hmm. so like it happened in other parts of the world take the christian community mm -hmm. you had the protestant movement the lutheran movement in in my own state in kerala there are this christians have a very large number of independent churches mm -hmm. right including churches where they elect their priests the priests are employees very democratic uh, approaches so communities are self formed through social processes mm -hmm. the state should not form them the uh, you know there is in the us the establishment clause mm -hmm. and that's implicitly in our constitution also that the state cannot establish a religion mm -hmm. or a community because mm -hmm. that is extremely invasive mm -hmm. so if there is a community if it's a self declared i we say all of us in this room are a community mm -hmm. right who can say we are not a community mm -hmm. and we then operationalize it and we function as a community mm -hmm. the question for the state is uh, uh, to what extent should they recognize us as a community mm -hmm. and to what extent should they give us rights of a community including the right of representation mm -hmm. Uh, or if we are a religious community in, to protect our religious uh, beliefs and practice our religion and not have discrimination against us mm. so uh, i think uh, dr ambedkar used a very basic word community as a as an organic flexible constantly evolving set of groups of people mm. that, you know that uh, are not created by anyone but by voluntary free human action so uh, the idea of community can come in conflict with the idea of individual the representation the the op, the mechan mechanism of representation yes which is based on universal adult franchise 
So it assumes that it starts with the premise that one person, one vote, one value. Yes. How does that principle evolve in the constitution and then what are the exceptions that are given for community-wise representation uh, for maybe based on linguistic or regional identities? So um, we are all members of multiple communities. Right. So we are not members of a single community. Mm -hmm. And uh, by and large, we can say all over the world that unless we belong to at least one or two powerful communities, uh -huh. we are completely marginalized. Mm -hmm. We are completely marginalized mm -hmm. because ultimately we need group support and we need individual freedom. So Article 38.2 of the Constitution says that we, uh, the state shall secure not only equality amongst individuals, mm -hmm. but also between groups of people, mm -hmm. between groups of people. So we both are important for us. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, groups are formed by free individuals, mm -hmm. free and equal individuals. Mm -hmm. So at the unit, the primacy is to individual equality and individual freedom. Mm -hmm. So you can't force people into groups or force them there. But they, the, as in exercise of their individual freedom, as social animals, they form groups mm -hmm. and they also want recognition as groups, mm -hmm. but they cannot be herded into groups. They cannot be locked into groups. You must have entry and exit, um, uh, you know, based on freedom of people. So that's the vision of the constitution. Mm -hmm. It's a very realistic vision that, that, that recognizes the importance of uh, free individuals forming free groups mm -hmm. and open groups. And that will also ensure that there is no conflict between these groups because vested interests will not uh, will not develop, right? There, there's room, the individual democracy within these groups will ensure that those groups also reflect the aspirations of its members and, and don't get captured by an oligarchy, which is a big risk of, of groups. Now, uh, we are facing a very unique situation right. of... Uh, uh, the, the union of communities right. because of some natural reason right. which is uneven population growth. Right. Some communities are growing faster than other communities. Yes. So we are looking at the possibility of uh, the current distribution of representation going to be unsettled mm. with the southern parts of the country set to lose representation or ha have its representation shunned while the political center of gravity of this country would increasingly shift to the region above the Vindhyas. Mm. How are we going to understand this process, this ongoing natural uh, uh, process, and how equipped is our constitutional scheme of things to deal with that challenge? And, uh, I've written in some detail about this uh, delimitation, and very broadly speaking, uh, the constitution as it now stands requires us to have a delimitation, which is a re, re fixing of the number of Lok Sabha seats uh, based on the, uh, the findings of the first census after 2026. Mm -hmm. So we don't, this 2021 census is not yet taken place. It should be 26 and then after that it should be 31. We don't know when it is, but it could be any time after 31 that census. There will be a delimitation. That Just a point of clarity, yes. life here. If they do one in twenty twenty seven, yes, that actually gets qualified yes, for yes, yes, yes. The first after twenty twenty six. So um, it could be, but uh, you know, the the tendency is for it to be delayed rather than we don't know. But mm. you're right, you're right. So um, uh, that will lead to based on thirty one projection of the population, it will lead to roughly slightly less than one thousand five hundred MPs in the Lok Sabha which is like a three times increase roughly of mm -hmm. the current strength. And uh, of that about 700 will go to the Hindi speaking North. And, uh, and so th their numbers are going to increase. So I, I agree that's a big issue and that's another topic. But the issue is how will that, uh, how, is that going to be a problem for representative democracy? Or is it going to be solved by representative democracy? I believe it is going to be solved by representative democracy because India is, is, a, is a country with a large number of relatively small communities. Now, if we, if we allow the aggregation, mm -hmm. if you build communities like Hindu, mm -hmm. and then you become 85% Hindu. Mm -hmm. right? But if you allow this to organically take place, mm -hmm. then take the Bihar census, right? The biggest community is around 15%. Mm. You know, it's not a huge uh, domination. Mm. But uh, so if we have representation of all communities, mm -hmm. we will have a 
very, very, um, you know, uh, spread out uh, uh, sort of set of communities with a few being larger than the others, but still quite spread out. And, and so there will not be scope for hegemony. Mm -hmm. There will not be scope for hegemony. And so this idea of north and south, I think, is something that I, it doesn't easily come to me because um, when we look at backward class to scheduled caste scheduled tribes, I mean, Ambedkar is a hero for the backward class scheduled caste scheduled tribes across the country, right? Um, Lohia is, an, is a hero. Uh, Narayana Guru is on the flag of BSP all over the, you know, in, in various parts of the country. Uh, so, um, Kanshiram is admired, right? So, we, we, Phule is admired everywhere in the country. Um, Periyar is a massive uh, hero for young people. So, we find that actually there is a tremendous uh, am amount of uh, common ground which does not have a north-south divide in terms of the consciousness of the social left that basically want to build a democratic society where there is Swaraj for everyone and there is no concentration of power, no oligarchy. So, if we have 1500 MPs who are representative of all these communities, we have much more space for representation of diverse communities, then we'll have a much more representative parliament with all their interests represented and the policies of the government will reflect more accurately the interests and needs of a wide section of our people that will provide us stability. And whereas, if there is an agenda which I will call the 3H agenda, Hindi, Hindu, Hindutva. And that is an agenda to impose one language, one religion and uh, one notion of, of India on the whole of the country. Right? If this increase in percentage is going to be used to advance a 3H agenda, then I think we are in trouble. We are in trouble. We are in trouble not because of the expansion. One person, one vote is a non-violable, sacred principle that we, we fought very hard. The common people of this country fought very hard to achieve. We will not compromise on that. So, regardless of how the population increases, we'll go by that. But that question is, what will that be used for? Will it be used to advance representation or will it, will it be used to advance imposition of one uh, domin dominant, uh, one small group's ideology on the rest of the country? The former happens, then India will move towards great stability and great prosperity. But if the 3H agenda is, is becomes the agenda of the new parliament, then I think we are going to be in big trouble, in big trouble. So this is a challenge to ensure, convince the, uh, the people of this country how important representative democracy is. I believe that representative democracy, which Dr. Ambedkar talked about a century ago, is the only way forward for this country to save this country we need to take it seriously we need to implement it at all level not only in the in the political field but in the social fields economic field it will make everyone feel secure because suddenly you will not be a hindu muslim christian you will be a community and there is no hierarchy we are all communities and we want to ensure that our community has a due share our interests are looked after and then we you know we are able to live in peace and, and stability in a nation which has an incredible, our greatest wealth is the diversity and, and uh, of our communities, right? And the large number of communities. We should not destroy that. We should strengthen it. Thank you, Mohan Gopal. That is a very profound thought, I should say, to end this conversation on. There's a lot to mull over. I'm sure we'll continue this conversation in various forms in the coming days. But thank you so much for joining the Hindu for this discussion on the working of Indian constitution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Burgess, for a very interesting conversation. Mm -hmm.